they will not know to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again. The message then, number one, must be clear. Number two, the message must be convincing. Convincing. The man is convinced. I now know I'm a sinner. I now know I cannot save myself. I now know I'm convinced that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Not just that he died, he died for me in particular. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that if I pray, he will listen to me. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The message then, number two, must be convincing. Number three, convicting. You know, you can convince the mind, convince the brain, convince the head. But the fellow is not convicted. How many people are convinced that sin is wrong? How many people are convinced that adultery is wrong? Fornication is wrong and stealing is wrong. How many people are convinced that smoking and drinking are actually wrong? But they're not convicted. And therefore the message number three must be convicting. When the people then will be running to the Lord. Lord, I want to be saved. How can I get out of this predicament and problem in which I find myself? Number four, the message must be compassionate. Yes, you are clear. Yes, you are convincing. And yes, you are convicting, but then you are compassionate as well. You have compassion upon them. You want them to get saved. You don't want to say anything or do anything that will rub them the wrong direction, but something that will make them to want to call upon the Lord because of your love. Number five, the message must be comprehensible. Comprehensible. That's different from being comprehensive. Comprehensible means understandable. Understandable. That means then the language you use, the vocabulary that you use, the words that you use. They will not be complicated words, difficult words that many, many people cannot understand. If you are talking to an individual, you look at the age of that individual, the understanding of that individual, the background of that individual, and therefore your illustrations will then be relevant and adjusted to the person you are speaking to. If you are speaking to a group of people, and that group of people, you have educated people there, you have illiterate people there, you have people who are scientifically minded there, and you have people who have never gone to school at all. Then you come to present the message to them, like you are preaching on a crusade field. Then you understand, you must not be too low that you miss the people on top. Neither must you be too high, you miss the people, you miss the people at the bottom. You make the message comprehensible. That's how to save souls. That's how to lead people to the Lord, because the message is comprehensible. Then, number six, the message is Christ-centered. You center everything on Christ. Are we talking about the sinner? Quickly talk about the Savior. Are we talking about their darkness? They quickly talk about the light, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Are we talking about their hopelessness? Talk about our hope in Christ. It's when you bring everything together that we're talking about sin, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about sinners. We're talking about the Savior. We're talking about the darkness. We're talking about the light. You make the message Christ-centered. And then when you end, you're not ending on a sorrowful note. I see, well, we're sinners. What a pity. We're sinners. We're hopeless. We're sinners. We're helpless. What can we do? You end up on a positive note. You end up with Christ. Number seven, the message is converting. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that the reason we're preaching? Isn't that the reason we're telling the people, come unto the Lord, and it will give you rest. It will make a change in your life. The man, and then the message, and then you have the ministry. Let's come back to Jonah. In Jonah chapter 3, we have here the word that came from the Lord unto Jonah. I'm reading from verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh that great city, and preach unto it the word of the preaching that I bid thee. Can you see three personalities there? Can you see three entities there? Number one, God. The origin of the message, the origin of the evangel, the origin of the good news, the origin of the gospel. God, the planner for our salvation. And it was the word of the Lord that came unto Jonah. Number two, we see Jonah, the communicator of the message. We we'll see Jonah, the carrier of the message of love. We we'll see Jonah here, the one that was to be the evangelist. Go on to number three, Nineveh. We we'll see the people. Here we have God, 
and the love of God flowing from him and flowing through Jonah and then getting to the audience, the target audience. That means then there are three entities that are very important in the communication of the message of the gospel. Number one, God, the source of the evangelistic message. Number two, the lost sinners, the Ninevites. The people in darkness and the people of the world that Christ has come to save. And then, number three, the soul winner, the evangelist, the channel through which or through whom the message is saved. And then, as we look at Jonah preaching the gospel, and as we look at you preaching the gospel, because Jonah is gone, and you are the one here today, as we look at you preaching the gospel, there are three things that actually are very important. I'm sure you've read this before in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'm reading there from the last verse, and now by the faith, hope, and charity, that's love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, that means it's love. There are three things that are very important. As you, as a soul winner, you as an evangelist, and you take the message of life, the message of salvation, and you take it to the people that talk to here. Number one, faith. Number two, love. Number three, hope. First, you have faith in God. That God is able to touch the hearts of the people you are speaking to. Even if they were dead before, he can open the ears of the dead and make them listen. Even if you are blind to the truth, he can open their eyes and make them see and reveal his truth unto them. Therefore, you have faith in God. With God, all things are possible. Nobody is irredeemable. Nobody has gone so far that he cannot be saved. The hand of the Lord is so long that it will catch anyone, anywhere, wherever he might have been. You have faith in God. Number two is love. You have love for the people, for the audience. And how that was so much missing in the life, in the ministry of Jonah himself. He wanted to declare the wrath of God, the condemnation and the judgment coming upon the Ninevites. But it wasn't filled with love. But we today, New Testament soul winners, New Testament evangelists, our hearts must be filled with the love of God. You love to tell the truth, but to tell it in love. Then number three is the hope that we also have, believing, hoping that the people, they're going to hear the word of God and the Lord will impact them. And the Lord will do something in their hearts, in their lives. He'll bring them out of their dungeon and captivity to Satan and sin. He'll bring them to the Lord. I pray the Lord will do it to you. Amen. That you will have the faith, you will have the love, you will have the hope that the people you are preaching to, they are not beyond the day of grace. And they are not irredeemable. That God is able to take them out of the place where they are and bring them into the kingdom of God. We're dividing the story tonight to three parts. Number one, the simplicity of the evangelistic message. The simplicity of the evangelistic message. Now, when we say something is simple, that doesn't mean the thing is uh, not having real content. For example, water. Water itself is very, very simple, but don't you, don't you see what water can do in our lives? Number one, then, the simplicity of the evangelistic gospel. Number two, salvation through the evangelistic message. Salvation through the evangelistic message. Number three, the summary of the evangelistic message. The summary of the evangelistic message. Let's come back to number one. The simplicity of the evangelistic message. Let's look at Jonah chapter 3. Verse 2. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Why was Jonah successful? Why did the people of Nineveh turn away from their wickedness? Why was there a kind of city-wide conversion? Why was there conversion from the top to the bottom, from the highest to the lowest, from the most exalted in that place to the least recognized in that place? Why did they so give their life to the Lord? Because Jonah was very faithful. The message the Lord had given him, he declared that message without fear, without favor. The messenger must be courageous. You fear the person who has sent you, rather than fearing the people, you are delivering the message to you. 
They not told Jeremiah, don't look at their eyes but their faces, lest I confound you and make you a brazen wall and a great pillar. They'll fight against you, but they'll not be able to conquer you. Therefore, go forth without fear, without the fear of man, and declare the message that I've given to you. Jonah, arise and go unto Nineveh, that great city. What are you going to preach? Jonah, you preach unto that city. The word, the preaching, the message that I bid thee, the message that I gave unto you. The message was present to be simple enough. To make the audience understand what salvation is all about. Now, if you listen to the message of Jonah, look at verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What word is here in his message? that the people of Nineveh would not understand the word yet, 40 days, and uh, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Very simple, very clear, but complete as well. That's all they needed to know, that God was giving them a period of grace. And when this period of grace is over, if they did not do anything about their lives, about their relationship with God, it will be over. Nineveh will be overthrown. Nineveh will be destroyed. And so, if we're going to really be successful and fruitful and flourishing and fulfilling in the evangelistic message, evangelistic ministry, we must be simple, we must be direct, we must be understandable, and we must be people that are able to declare the word of God without fear, without favor. Now, in the New Testament, what message are we being given that we're going to deliver to the people? What's the evangelistic message? The content of the evangelistic message we're giving to the people. Let's look at the word of God in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Remember the simplicity of the gospel in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Here we read the word of God and it says, and it said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the message we are to preach. Go ye into all the world. Any part of the world you go, a village, a city, a nation, in Africa, outside Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in America, in the commonwealth of independent nations, independent states, here, anywhere you go, in the English-speaking country or Francophone country, anywhere you go, this is what you have to preach. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And preach the gospel. And what's the gospel? The good news. What's the good news? The glad tidings that sinners don't need to perish. But Jesus Christ came, he sacrificed on the cross of Calvary so that everyone can be saved. Then he says in verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Luke chapter 24. Take the message with you. The message that was told to preach. In the case of Jonah, the Lord had given words to preach. In the case of the New Testament believer, the Lord is saying, our master, the captain of our salvation, he gave us that message, what we are to declare. And here it is, in Luke chapter 24, verse 46 and verse 47. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Now, do you understand? It's not remission of sin and repentance later. It's repentance and after that, remission, removal, forgiveness, cleansing, pardon for sin will come after that repentance. What are we then to preach? We go out to the people of the world, whether they're men or women, whether you're preaching to a crowd or you're preaching to an individual, you're preaching that makes you repent. Repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. What are we to preach in America? Repentance and remission of sins. What are we to preach in Europe? Repentance and remission of sins. What are we to preach to the sick people? Repentance and remission of sins. 
What are we to preach to the poor? The poor that need money. They need the wherewithal. Where will they be able to sustain their lives? If we're preaching the gospel to them, even in their poverty, repentance and remission of sins. That's what we're to preach. And we preach that among all nations. Are they white? Repentance and remission of sins. Are they black? Repentance and remission of sins. And we're to preach that in all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. And let's see how the apostles carried this out. Or they preach that repentance and remission of sins. We're looking at uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore. It just went straight. And you remember Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. In Acts chapter 2, repent. Acts chapter 3, repent. They were not tired of repentance, preaching to sinners. This is a different group. It's a different crowd. These people too need to be saved. And anyone that needs to be saved must hear the word of repentance. You don't change it. You don't say, people will say, I'm, re I'm repeating myself. Because you see, last week, I was preaching to those people in Jerusalem. And I said, repent. And now I come to a new crowd, maybe still in Jerusalem. If I say repentance again, they say, doesn't she have another thing to speak about when you're talking to sinners? Anywhere they are. In any community and in whatever situation you may find them, the message is repent. Chapter 3, verse 19. In that chapter 3, verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted. You see that that's very clear. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In verse 26, continue for us, God. Having raised up his son, Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's the message. That's the message. The Lord told them, he gave them the message. And he said, this is what to carry to the people of the world. And they were faithful. And they carried just that at chapter 13. At 13 verse 16. And then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience, pay attention. In verse 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you heareth God to you, is this word of salvation says, the word of salvation. You see, the people were very clear. When the people were sinners, they were not making them happy, jovial, relaxed, and talking about healing, and talking about deliverance and prospect and everything. Even if they were going to get healed later, yet the word of repentance must be very, very clear. And then he tells us in verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew not him, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfills them, they fulfill them in condemning him, though they found no cause of death in him. Yes, desire that Pilate, desire they Pilate, that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen of many, he was seen many days of them, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people, and will declare unto you the glad tidings. The gospel, the good news, Jesus Christ has died, you don't need to die again. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is, it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now, no more to return to corruption. It says, on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, it says also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer than holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption be known unto you. Therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sin. You see that? Every faithful community is a fact that you are